on January 1st, 2021, Mposele passed away. I wanted to do something special to celebrate her in this day, February 26th, 2021, which would have been her birthday. Therefore, uh, with the help of Play Africa and Po family, we collected testimonies from different peoples. And as you will see, some are funny, some are touching, but each one of them is authentic and really represent the impact that Mpo has had in our lives and in the lives of so many people. So there it is. Uh, this is a re-edition of the interview that we had in uh, October. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, all along this interview, there will be pieces of these stories that... Uh, we are holding and that space that is still there for you, Po. And personally, I wanted to thank you for being my friend and for being such a beautiful inspiration. Till the day we meet again, my friend. Miss you. Love you. My name is Tulani. Um, I was working with Sister Mpo at Constitutional Hill. Sister Mpo was a very nice person. Um, she always greet us uh, when she's coming here in the morning because uh, we were here at early in the morning. And when she came here, she greeted everyone. She was very nice. And then, um, yo, uh, she was a very perfect, perfect person. May her soul rest in peace. This is episode four of Innovating Education featuring Mpo Sele, Player Learning Supervisor at Play Africa. Play Africa is an independent children's museum. Their approach to public learning disrupts the idea of what a museum can be. They catalyze innovations in creative learnings, children's rights, parents' engagement and social cohesion. They offer interactive, playful learning experiences for 1 million children aged 10 and under, accompanied by their families and teachers. Play Africa's original exhibits and programs are designed to support children's cognitive, emotional, social and physical development. They are developed to be inclusive of children with special needs and disabilities. In Johannesburg, they are based inside a former prison at the iconic Constitution Hill, just 15 meters from Nelson Mandela's cell. They transformed this apartheid-era prison from a site of humiliation oppression and fear into a joyful family playscape of discovery and learning. Find out more about Play Africa by visiting their website playafrica.org.za or Facebook at Play Africa Children's Museum. You can also find out more on Twitter at Play Africa CM and on Instagram at Play Africa. Sele is a former nursery school teacher who discovered Play Africa in 2016. Since then, she joined the team as a play and learning facilitator, leading Plays Africa high quality early learning programs in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. As the daughter of a man who was born blind, she has a lifetime awareness of the social toll barriers to access faced by many people with disabilities. She became Play Africa first inclusivity coordinator and led the Children's Museum engagement to create South Africa's first custom-built sensory play exhibit. Now, as Play Africa's play and learning supervisor, she oversees all play and learning initiatives and directs the Youth Work Readiness Initiative, training previously unemployed youth in play and learning methodologies. In this conversation, Mpo will discuss the importance of being an advocate of inclusion in all aspects of your life. She will share with us what is the true meaning of inclusion. Mpo will demonstrate why listening to the children and letting them lead the play is at the core of Play Africa. 
She will also explain why children must be seen and included as citizens. Our guests will share with us why failure should be seen as a learning and teaching opportunity and the importance of acknowledging children as dignified human beings. Find out more about Play Africa by visiting their website playafrica.org.za or visiting the Facebook page at Play Africa Children's Museum. Check out their Instagram page at Play Africa or the Twitter page at Play Africa CM. Welcome, Paul. If it's for you, once my body gets to sway and promise you won't be complaining. And I'll be saying, yeah, yeah. Can I dance for you? Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for this beautiful introduction. I, I hope the listeners don't think I'm like 58 or something. I feel like I've done so much. <laughs> I'm you only see? 41. <laughs> No, I'm just, I'm just thinking like, wow, okay, all right, okay, I've, I've done a bit. I, I, I just hope nobody thinks I'm uh, 58 and I, I have a PhD, but at least you didn't say Dr. Mpotzele, so they know that no. Soon, <laughs> soon, soon. Just I, like a, I wouldn't just be surprised. Thing. I wouldn't be oh, surprised. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just your cool girl next door person. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Asum Po, for the dedication you showed in children. But more than anything, thank you personally for teaching me how to make complex topics or concepts relatable to children and actually modeling what it is that you're trying to communicate with the children in a language that they better understand. Thank you for that skill and it is something that I'll cherish and use uh, for the long time to come. Thank you. Mpo, thank you for encouraging me um, in the facilitating world, especially at Play Africa, because I was the only guy who was there uh, doing the internship with the ladies. So I was a bit shy at times, but as Mpo did say, there's no world for guys or boys you belong here so she made me belong at play africa and also made me believe in myself i'm really grateful for all the learnings she gave me especially with the kids with needs special needs uh, on that syllabus i'm really grateful for everything may his soul rest in peace So, Paul, what is your first memory from school? Whoa, okay. In, in total, I went to uh, three schools. I, um, I started school quite early. I was four years old when I started school, I think. And that was the first grade. And I think right now, the first grade, you have to be six or something like that. So I started quite early because I could read. I could... Um, do the thing, you know, I, I could understand a lot of things that um, four-year-olds should not be able to understand at that time. And this was brought about because my dad was born blind and I'm the first of uh, five children. Um, so, you know, my mom was taking care of my father. And so I would emulate everything that my mom does. You know, my mom would read the newspaper to my dad and I just thought, oh, this is what people do. And I, obviously, being the only child at that time, you only emulate your parents, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, this is what um, human beings do. So I would just look at my mom reading the newspaper to my dad, and it was a giant newspaper, not the tabloid stuff, you know. It was like it was called a star newspaper. It was huge, you know. It, it just to, I, I, I probably it was the length of the newspaper because I'm so short, <laughs> but you know, and I would. I would be interested in uh, words that, you know, sometimes my mom would ask my dad, okay, uh, what is this word? Because my, my mom had not even done her matric at that time. And matric is uh, the 12th grade, I think. Yeah, my mom had not even done her schooling at the time. My mom actually finished her matric when I finished matric. So she, she was a shepherd girl from the Eastern Cape. I, they met with my dad at some gigs because my dad was a musician. 
um, he was a music producer. And so, yeah, that's, that's, how they, that's how they hooked up. But then that's another podcast, I suppose. Wow, um, <laughs> I didn't know that. So your father was yeah, a, that's <laughs> a blind music produ uh, producer. Yes, he was a music producer. He was a music producer. Um, and, um, yeah, and he went to school for the blind in Cape Town uh, here in South Africa. It was the only school back then that could accommodate um, children with low vision or that were completely blind. And, um, yeah, so that's how my parents met. So I just, you know, started learning these um, skills from a very early age. You know, I would sit there and, and when they were done with the newspaper, I'd take it. And, you know, if I could, if I, apparently I was very good at memorizing things, you know, I don't, I don't know what happened to my brain in the process throughout the years, <laughs> but I used to remember things, <laughs> I used to remember things, I think it's kids, you know, <laughs> having kids will age you sometimes. Probably, I so, wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> then I would, I would take the newspaper, it didn't matter what page I was on, but I would, you know, recite what my mom was reading, you know, and at some point they thought I could read. And then my mom just thought, oh, well, seeing that she's doing this, maybe let, let me just show her the words. But I think that apparently that started when I was um, almost three years old. You know, um, I, I'm by no means a, 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 a protege or a savant of any kind. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just relating what I was told, you know. So by the age of four, I remember how proud I was of myself, you know, uh, when I was four. I had read the entire newspaper to my dad. Yeah, it took two days for me to read the entire newspaper to him, but I didn't. You know, <laughs> in, uh, the, the sports from the, you know, the scores that he already knew, things that he already knew, but, you know, it was, it was quite encouraging that I read, you know, all the words and, you know, even the words I didn't understand, you know, I would break it down or I'd spell the letters and tell my dad, what is this and that and that and that, what, is that? what does this mean? And then my dad would have to tell me the word and then he'd also give me the meaning of the word so that I understood what I was reading, you know. So uh, my, my school memory was, so I, I became the child who didn't play much, you know, um, because I started seeing that, oh, okay, my, I started realizing my dad is blind. And my, back, back then in South Africa, my dad was not allowed to have a guide dog um, because he was black. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which is crazy, but um, so he, had, he, had, he was not allowed to have a guide dog and um, he did not like um, using the, the cane because for him, it, it was, he, he saw it as um, like an imprisonment of some sort um, because, because it was being enforced upon him that, you know, when they said you can't have a guide dog, he said, they said to him, you, you must use a cane and he didn't like that. And we had dogs at home. And he was saying, okay, can you train my dogs then if you don't want to give me the, the state's guide dog? Train my dogs. Um, we had yeah, quite feisty dogs. They were, ooh, ooh, I don't think they would have been guide dogs. They would just, they would just be fighting dogs there. So, so the system did not permit him to, to have a guide dog, you know. So my mom ended up having to um, take care of my dad's business quite a lot, you know, having to take him to places, going there with him. So it, he lost a bit of his independence then. And my dad is a very independent um, person, um, you know, and he always, he always said to me, you know, when people said, oh, you know, in I'll say this in Sesotho because that's mm -hmm. the language that I grew up Perfect. around a lot. Oh, and I'll, I'll just translate it like, oh, in shem so it means, oh, shame, poor him, he's blind. But I mean, for me, he had done so much already when, by the time I was born, he had produced, he had formed bands. He, had, he was working with a lot of um, famous groups in, in, in South Africa then, you know. And so I, I was a kid that didn't play much. And I just thought, I need to be able to take care of my dad. Should anything happen to my mom? I need to be able to read his contracts because they don't come in Braille. I need to be able to do this. So it, it was not something that was enforced on me by my parents, but it was something that I just thought I need to do, you know. So I, I already had that. I, ne I needed to, to, to be like a, a social, socially responsible advocate for people that are unable to do certain things for themselves. Strangely, I was always the smallest kid. I don't know why. <laughs> and, and you're still quite small. <laughs> I'm still quite small. I was the smallest kid everywhere I was. And, but I always found myself advocating for um, anybody who 
was treated unfairly, you know, because I didn't want to be treated unfairly either. I, I, I could see, even though, you know, my parents would kind of hide certain things from me, but I was smart enough to understand a lot of the things that were being spoken about, even if they used a different language. They use a language in South Africa. It's Afrikaans. It's one of the official languages. And, you know, which is uh, what the whole uh, fighting about is in 1976 when the students, you know, there was an yeah. uprising and the students did not want to be taught in that language because it was seen as the language of the oppressor. And because it was being enforced upon them. Uh, to be honest, I know Africans, but I do not want to be doing mathematics in Africans. Trust me. <laughs> I would fail dismally. Yeah. And so I, I, I always wanted to stand up, you know, for, for people that were marginalized. I stood up for myself, you know, being small, being teased because I was small and, you know, being called a dwarf. I'm not. Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but, you know, people are people. <laughs> so I, I've always felt that sense of responsibility. So I was like a grown up kid all the time in, in, at school. And when kids were playing in the playground, we had a, a made, the, 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 there was a helicopter or an airplane like structure in the playground. And I'd always want to be the pilot, um, you know, and I'd say, oh no, no, I'm going to be the pilot because being the pilot gives me that chance to sit down and read my book. Um, so I'd be sitting and reading my books Right. And not really playing, not really engaging in the play with other children, you know, and I'd be like, you know, somebody would have to remind me like, hey, have we not arrived yet in Durban? I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, yes, everyone we have now arrived in Durban. You may alight. <laughs> All passengers coming to the Durban airport, please get off the flight. So, <laughs> so that was... <laughs> <laughs> so that was me. I, I, I you still get that. Book. I can perfectly envision really? you doing that. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, but then there was one time where I had passengers, and throughout the break time, they all sat. And when you know, when it, when the when the bell rang, and they were like, "Ah, Mpo, hi, you're a boring, you're a boring <laughs> pilot." We didn't even go anywhere. We stayed in the air the whole break. And then I realized, like, and for me, it was like, ah, what's the big deal? What's your problem here? I read a good book. Like, I don't understand. Why, why weren't you guys reading great books, you know? And so, then because, because I'd flown so much with my parents, I had already uh, that, that witty answer, the quick answer. I'm like, guys, mm -hmm. really, going to Durban does not take 15 minutes. It actually, well, back then it took like an hour, 20 minutes. The, the flights are quicker now. It's just like 59 minutes. And I'm like, it, it actually takes an hour and 20 minutes. And to go to Cape Town takes two hours and 37 minutes. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had everything to the T because I had flown so much with my parents, uh, with my dad being, you know, in the music industry. So, yeah, that was my, that was my early memory of being a child and not really playing. Wow. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't play much. <laughs> Only because you made a way. Oh, Paul, thank you for reminding me how powerful music is, how it can turn a bad day into an amazing one. I will miss you pushing me to give my best at all times. I will definitely miss singing with you, but I will remember you with all the playlists that we always listen to. You will forever be in my heart. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mpa, for your love, your guidance your sisterhood, your friendshipness, your smile, our talks. Um, I'm grateful to have met you. I'm grateful for the connections you've done for me. I'm grateful that I'm at Play Africa and that was all because of you. I'll always love you and be a great angel for us. play but you are a daughter you are a mother as well so how were you able to make that that shift from you not playing to encouraging your children to actually explore and play so 
um, yeah, in your, in your introduction, you know, you did say that I started out as a nursery school teacher. I actually started out in the entertainment industry because the bug bit me after, you know, you know, hanging out with my dad a lot. Um, I, I'm not a singer. I do love to sing, but I'm not a singer. But I worked in the entertainment industry from the age of 19 because I was already done with school. Like I said, I started school quite early. Um, so um, I, I started in the entertainment industry and before I moved into that. So how I, how I started playing, I was, uh, and I'm, my, my husband and I have been friends since um, 19, from 1988 that I was in standard, we call it standard three, I think it's fifth grade. I think, I hope I'm right. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just check what standard three is in your country. <laughs> so that's when we met. And I was, I was eight years old. He was 10. Uh, we were in the same class. And that, so when I was 28, uh, we were coming back from work. And the kids had gone to my mom's for the weekend. And so it was, we, we, we came back a little later um, because obviously the kids are not there. So we came gallivant a bit. And we went, we were walking past the park near our place. And he said, oh, let's go swing. And I was like, huh? He's like, let's go swing. I was like, uh, why? He's like, for fun. I was like, I don't know how to swing. <laughs> he says, you're kidding. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. And I said, just think about it. Have you ever seen me play at school? He's like, wait, come to think of it, you were always the pilot. If you're not the pilot, you were always... <laughs> I was always in that role. You know, I was always the referee. I was the pilot. I was the teacher. He's like, come to think of it, you never really played. You, you were, wait, you're going to learn how to swing today. <laughs> and I said, no, they, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, and he says, look, there's nobody in the park. No one's going to laugh at you. You're 28 years old. You must know how to swing. Your, the kids know how to sing. I'm like, yeah, because you go with them to the park. And I always say I have laundry to do because I don't know how to, navigate around the park equipment you know i had the smarts i had the, the i had the iq but i did not have the play cue <laughs> <You know? laughs> so i learned how to swing when i was 28 and it was so fun he says to me you know science right i said yes he's like okay now use that every action has a reaction you need to propel yourself forward the reaction that you'll come back i was like that is not the one but hey let's go with whatever you're saying that is not the formula you're supposed to be using but, so that, that none being me came back but i was like look and i said to myself calm down this is your man he wants to have fun with you this you know, go with it. And I had so much fun that we only got home at 8.30 p.m. So that was your introduction to play. That was my introduction to play. Well, I and think you caught up since then, eh? <laughs> too much. Uh, no, I don't think I've caught up. I'm still playing. I'm, I'm, I'm still playing. I, I, I play a lot. Yeah. I, I, I think I play too much. No, there's no such thing. No, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's how I started playing. And I just saw... You know, that I was like, this is so fun. Why would any child not want to do this? You know, why would, why would I not want to share this moment with my kids? You know, but um, then, so the, me having kids, I like staying home with, with my kids. So um, my second born was still quite young uh, then. And I used to like teach my kids at home. But at home, I was a playful um, I don't call myself an educator, though, a playful mom, playful educator in the house. It's just the outside world that was just ugh, for me. <laughs> but, you know, teaching kids, because I always want kids to understand what they are learning. I always want them to understand. And not every child understands by looking at characters, like letters and numbers in the book. Some kids are kids that learn like with things that are tangible you have to show them you have to touch something you have to squeeze something you have to break something you know you have to allow certain things to get out of control but as long as as long as it's safe that's what's important for me so when I you know when I had my last one and I am saying it is my last one my <laughs> are my you last, sure <laughs> I can't do this anymore <laughs> It takes a long time to get this figure back. <laughs> <laughs> I so, feel you, I feel you. Know, you. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I used to, so I used to love, I, I love watching cartoons. I think that's my other thing, you know. So, and I mean, since, since I was younger, the, the cartoons and other programs that we watch on TV, you know, they've, 
become educational. I was a huge fan of Sesame Street yeah. um, as a kid, uh, which we have now as the Kalani Sesame. Yes, in our country, and they're doing you know, amazing things. They're in the, doing really, yes, really amazing wonderful. things. Wonderful. Hopefully, I can, I can, yeah. I can uh, interview some of of these people. Like this is a, such an inspiring I project. Hope you do. Yes, I hope, yes. I hope you do. And and uh, so when because I watched Sesame Street, it was on a television channel called Bob TV back then. It's no longer in existence. But watching Sesame Street, watching um, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, you know, and, and just seeing like how they incorporate uh, learning into playful things, using puppets, using, uh, you know, characters, using pictures and drawing, using music. And I gravitated towards music because of my dad, you know. Um, I learned how to tell the time by watching Sesame Street, you know. Um, I used to... Uh, I, I thought Cookie Monster was very disgusting and he had like horrible <laughs> manners, but I liked him anyway, you know, um, <laughs> because my mom would turn it and say, oh, you see, um, you know, etiquette, teaching me etiquette. You don't have to chew like Cookie Monster, but, you know, and I love the, you know, the, the, the empathy that um, Big Bird showed. I love, you know, there's certain things. And I thought, like, oh, I could easily teach my kids using these kind of tools. And that is what I did. So uh, me becoming a nursery school teacher, I was... It was actually by accident. I'm I'm not even an, a qualified edu- I'm not even a qualified educator on paper. I but life the, qualified the, you. I'm a life qualified teacher, but I don't have the papers to say, "Hey, look," you know. And so I, I was at this nursery school that my sister used to go to, and it was in such a terrible state. My mom went there, and she called me actually from there. And my 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 little one was still like a year and a half, you know, almost two. You know, um, I was still like a mummy at home. And my mom said, I cannot believe this. I came here and this is what it looks like. And, and we saw it and it used to look so great. And it was just like great. It was just like dull. It, it looked like we had walked into a prison. You know, the kids were just seat, sitting on the floor. There was a so-called teacher, educator, wrapped, in, wrapped herself in a blanket. And she was saying, come on, sing, sing, sing. Okay, the next song thing and I'm like are you like I would sleep if I was a kid I'd just sleep you know so for me it was like come on man you know and I, I just thought let me see the great art classes and I went to the great art classes and um the kids just had papers and crayons and they were just scribbling on the paper yes scribbling is great for a kid's fine motor skills I'm all for that but the kids did not even know their basic shapes some of the kids didn't even know basic colors. Your primary colors, some kids didn't even know. You know, you'll ask a child, what color is this? And they would just say whatever color that pops into their head. You're showing them red, they are saying it's orange. Yes, it probably could be, and you'd think maybe there's a, you know, but, but others would just say black or, you know, they didn't know um, animals, they didn't know where their fruits come from you know they didn't know that fruits grow on trees and I'm thinking I have an almost two-year-old who can point out shapes when I'm asking him hey LJ where's where's the square baba and he'll go and fetch a square what else can you find that's a square in the house the table is a square the you know the side plate that mommy likes the most is a square what else can we find that is a rectangle the television is a rectangle my almost two-year-old could point at things that are you know, similar in shape, you know, could point at certain, even though sometimes some certain things were kind of like a polygon, but, you know, for the fact that he recognizes that there are four sides on that thing and there's a six-year-old, that hurt me as a parent. It hurt me as a mother because I know most of our mothers, they drop off their kids at the nursery school with the hope that somebody will teach them because they have to be at their workplaces at seven and they knock off at seven, in the, at seven again at night, which is just the reality of what's happening in our country. Some parents don't really get to see their kids. They see them in the morning when they dress them and then somebody else picks them up. By the time they, the parent comes home, the child has been put to bed. So it, it really hurt me as a parent that somebody else's child is unable to do what my two-year-old can do. And I know that every child has the potential to do that. Kids are like sponges before they... Uh, turn seven you know we you know we talk about the first thousand days of a kid's life 
those those kids are sponges they will say things back to you that you like oh so that's what i speak like that's what i say this, these are the words i use because we imitate you know kids will, will will emulate what they see so that means at school they're not seeing anything the teacher's sitting there wrapped in a blanket almost half asleep and telling the kids giving the kids paper and a pen not t- not telling them what to do with it you know and so the kids were just scribbling so that's what sparked my passion and I just became a volunteer at that nursery school and so I volunteered um, from my from that moment that my child was two that's in 2015 he was almost he was almost two in 2015 so I started then and you know in in 2016 that's when how I met um, uh, Gretchen uh, from Play Africa and that's when I started volunteering then. Thank you, Sister Mpo. I will always remember you. I miss your dignity and your respect and the way you are dressed. I will remember you when the sun, when the sun rises and the sun sets. Justice Baloi. Nyabonga Sister Mpo, Zokumbula, the way out of Kona, Nasloni Poako, and Zopindanu Kumbula Ilanga Malpuma, Nalogushona, Justice Baloi. What are the challenges that these children are facing? The other challenges that we face, Steve, is child-headed homes. There is no adults to guide the children, you know. Um, the, uh, our system, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say that it isn't where it should be in terms of, you know, foster care for, for children that don't have parents. Um, children living in the inner city, they're they are afraid to go out to the parks because the parks are filled with people that are homeless. Um, they are filled with drug dealers. There are very unsafe things that are left on the floors of the park. You can find syringes, you can find used syringes, um, you know, just all, all sorts of unsightly items. Sometimes you find medication on, uh, on the park floors and children are afraid to go to the park and play and you know, even though this came to me as a 28-year-old, I know how important it is for the gross motor skills. Those things are not just there for kids to pass time, but they build the, 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 the child's, um, you know, uh, balance. They, they build a lot of gross motor skills, even fine motor skills. You know, when you are pushing that merry-go-round, you're using a lot of your fingers and in your hands. You know, um, the soil in the park, the grass in the park, um, you know, you feel certain things. You so so they miss out on all of that. They go they go into the they stay in a four world you know environment. They go to school in flats as well. We have a lot of schools that are in flats and they don't have places to play. The schools are under resourced. Uh, the their parents those that live with their parents they have a the parents are, are, are in workplaces where it's no work no pay. So you don't come to work, you don't get to pay. And they work Saturdays as well. And unfortunately, Play Africa is not open on Sundays, you know, where maybe they could come, you know. Um, but we are, you know, on Saturdays, it, it's, it's hard for the parents to even take time because then they have to think, do I go and take my child to play or do I get the chores done that I cannot get done during the week? So, yeah, those are some of the, the, the challenges that we have. And it's it's... Yeah, it's it's quite it's quite hard for anyone yes. to think about yes. them. Yes, yes. Let's let's just also uh, for the audience uh, in your lifetime, and you you mentioned that before you actually experienced the apartheid, um, and so the freedom and the democracy in South Africa is so recent. It's such a young democracy um, in our lifetime, actually, because I remember being a kid and watching the news and and the day. Uh, Madiba was uh, freed and everything, so there's a long, there's still a long road to go. But the 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 the, the what has been covered and and done so far is quite amazing. There's still many challenges, but this is really a, a place that that f- fulfill me with hope. And when I do see a, a project like the one uh, Play Africa, it's so inspiring. Like seriously. Uh, Compared to other things that I've seen in the world, it's 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 an amazing, it's incredible project. Hi everyone. 
thank you for being part of this journey. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm just getting started with this podcast and you leaving me a review helps a lot. Make sure you join the Facebook group to continue this conversation and discover exclusive content. Subscribe to the newsletter to find out more about the episodes and the guests. You know, you know, say, oh, my baby. Can we, so you were about to tell us about um, when you met with Gretchen and uh, who is the CEO of Play Africa and uh, what pushed you and led you to, 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 to get committed to, to this initiative. So when I, when I met Play Africa, obviously, you know, um, changing, like, like, you know, with our democracy, it, we are now 25 years in, 26 years in, into our democracy, and there's still a lot to be done. So, you know, overnight change is not, <laughs> is, is not a thing. Even when you're trying to, to, to go on a, a new eating health plan, you don't just go cold turkey and go overnight like, yes, Today I'm going to eat my giant enormous burger, but tomorrow I'm eating my salad straight and my water. It doesn't happen like that. So we're still in the process of really um, changing the way the nursery school looked, changing the way um, teachers view the children, you know, um, because I don't think at that point the teachers viewed the children with respect um, or with the dignity that the children deserve, you know. Um, so it, it was just like, oh, I'm here to keep you safe until your mom or dad comes back to pick you up. So it was almost like, uh, yeah, just don't, just don't, just don't get lost. <laughs> just stay here and don't get lost and be okay. Paul, thank you for being my colleague, being my sister being my friend and all the lessons that you have done in my presence about being a parent. I think with all the workshops that we're doing with the educators, I've learned a lot from those workshops. I'm a good parents, parent today is because of those lessons. So Paul, I really appreciate my sister and good night and rest in peace. Bye. Mpotile, thank you for teaching me how to adjust to life and how to relate to other people's stories through facilitating um, at Play Africa. It really has changed my life by seeing how you talk to kids, how you would make them feel like they're in their own special world. And I'll forever be grateful for that because it teaches me how to adjust in life. Do you think it also had to do with the way the teachers and the educators perceive themselves? Um, you know, I, I think I, I never really quite gave it a lot of thought um, because my focus was like, I need the kids to learn better. I need So even the, the, the educators that were there at the time, when these changes started being implemented, they started disappearing. You know, they, they just decided to not show up. Only two, only two stayed out of the ones that were there. Only two out of the five that were there stayed um, because they wanted to see change. You know, they were eager to see the change. So I don't know about the, the teachers, how they saw themselves. I, I, I didn't really want to give it some thought. But for me, I think the anger at that time said, if you are leaving, that means you are part of the problem. I'm working with, I, I want to work with people with solutions. So I really did not give it, thought and but it's actually a good thing that you asked I do want to give it some thought now <laughs> afterwards so anyway um how I met Gretchen was that um a, a former colleague of ours who's now an educator at um streetlight schools her name is Nosi she came she was doing outreach for Play Africa and she came and she talked about Play Africa she was telling me what Play Africa does you know and I was like wow I've never heard of a children's museum because in the South African contents a museum is a old place that keeps old things or just like archives and or they show you about the history only of South Africa and that is not it's not a fantastic place to go to as a four-year-old I, I, I'd, I'd be as much as I was like that 
kind of four year old, I'd probably be bored out of my mind after two visits. You know, even you. So <laughs> <laughs> even now, even now, as a forty one year old, I'd be like, mm-mm, mm-mm, let's not do this. You know, this is not interesting because I mean, kids, kids are it's 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 inept in them to touch and want to you know investigate. We're little investigators, and. So in, in our museums, you cannot touch, you can't do, you can't, you know, it's hands on the sides or hands to the back and, you know, you touch with your eyes, basically. So, yeah, so, so, that's, so when I met Nosi, Nosi explained everything about Play Africa and I'm like, wow, it would be so incredible if you guys came. Can I show you around the, the you know, the nursery school? And I showed her and I said, it's, it's, it's basically, it's empty. So basically what we we're doing first was to clean it. We were thoroughly cleaning the place. So we were still in the process of thoroughly cleaning the place because I believe cleanliness is very, very important, you know, um, which is why you, which is why they used to find a lot, of, a lot of children were very, very ill at the school because it wasn't clean. So for me, it was very important that we give them a clean and safe environment to begin with. It's no use bringing all these great gadgets and, you know, great posters and sticking them on the wall and when it's not clean. It does not make sense for me. So that's where we started. So we were still in that process. And because I'm not a, 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 certi- a certified educator, it was like I needed to know, I needed to, I was also in the process of educating myself what is needed at a nursery school because I didn't really take my kids to a nursery school because I was at home with them. And I, I could teach them the things that were needed, you know, for them to be able to be ready for school. And... So, so I was in that process and I showed no, and Nosti said, look, you have the space, it's clean, let's, let us come, let's show you exactly what I'm saying, because what I'm describing and your questions, um, if, I, if we came and showed you, you'll understand, you'll have answers to your questions. And I said, great. So on Mandela Day, they came um, on, in uh, 2016, yeah, they came and you know, it was not, what I really loved about Play Africa is that it was not a show. You know, sometimes people put up a show for Mandela Day. It's like, oh, look at us, we're doing so great. But for Play Africa, it was not a show. There was no media. Yes, we did um, consent to pictures being taken because obviously every organization needs their m e You know, you need to do your impact video for your, or your photography for your funders and donors and all of this so yes there was there were pictures taken but it was not pictures to show off like oh look at how great we are look at what we're doing for these poor kids you know it was not they they came there you know and treated us with dignity even though we had nothing at the nursery school you know we had we had we had the space that's all we had and for me just seeing the kids light up just seeing a child who hadn't spoken ever since I met them four days before to hear them say, wow, which means, wow, these things are beautiful. For me, just that sentence changed everything. I did not hear that child's voice, but Play Africa came and I heard that that child has a voice. Because you'll speak to them, you're like, hi, how are you? But they're not used to people speaking to them. They're not used to people treating them like adults. They're used to being yelled at. They're used to being pushed away. They're used to being seen and not heard. So that is why I, I said to myself, you know, I even said on the day, I said to Gretchen, hey, you don't know it yet, but one day I will be working with you and I will be making changes in the children's spaces with you. And Gretchen looked at me, she giggled and she said, you know what, I believe you. And, that's, and then she walked away and <laughs> here I am. Wow. And here I am. Wow. Great story. I should, have, I should have also said great storyteller in your, in your oh, introduction, yeah. which you are. <laughs> Thank you. Dear and Paul, thank you so much for helping build Play Africa. You have been a designer, thinker, creator, implementer, assessor, and joyful, joyful co-creator with our team and with me. And your contribution to Play Africa will be remembered forever. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kulani Kush Mjali, and I am the drummer of the band called Late Antique. Uh, I met Osimpo a couple of years back, uh, back when she was working with the Department of Arts and Culture. 
and the fondest memories I have with her was how she would, could impact me personally about how she never allowed us to be mediocre, never allowed the talent to be mediocre, always made sure that we were presentable, always on time, always made sure that this art or the music that we do will never be taken lightly or that we should never take ourselves lightly. Fast forward, uh, re-meeting her again uh, with um, Play Africa and the most impactful message that really shook me was when she gave kids uh, to draw a couple of stuff, you know, to draw images about how what beauty is and the kids began to draw something very strange, something outside of themselves. So she therefore gave them all a mirror and said, draw who you are and they started to draw what they saw themselves in but this was a very pivotal message on showing the kids, our kids, our people that yet again, black is beautiful. So thank you so much Asimpoor and you have impacted me in knowing how to raise these young ones. I, 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 can, you, can we talk a little bit more about children not being seen i know that one of the things that you work on a lot at play africa is that yes i am here i exist i am here to be seen right and also from a human right perspective can you talk to us a little bit more about that aspect and what you do as a, a, what the whole team does at the play africa you know we um we 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 have a, a saying that uh, it was actually britain was watching this show Uh, I was watching a show um, about a certain hotel. Uh, I don't remember the name of the hotel, but you know they were just showing that from from the, the from the very first person that you come into contact with, if you're driving, it would be your valet, the the the, the doorman, the security. You know, each and every person there was treated and treating guests with dignity. So at Play Africa, we always say that. We are people with dignity and we serve people with dignity. And the serve people with dignity, it, it, it has a double meaning. It means that we serve with dignity, like as servants, whatever we do, we do it in a dignified manner and that we see you as a dignified person. So we serve people with dignity. So it has a double meaning to it. So you have dignity as a human being. And we recognize that and we recognize you and we recognize children because we are a children's museum. Um, when children come, you know, um, most of our children in our country, they're used to being referred to as, uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't even, I won't even know how to translate this. Uh, I, I will, actually. It's like when you say, you know, people never really call them by name. They don't recognize them. They don't. It's like, hey, when, hey, you, it's like a thing. You know, but when we when, when the children come there, we they come to us and we will ask them their names, we'll give them name badges so that we call them by their name instead of saying, Hey, excuse me, uh, snapping your fingers like I don't like even the, the restaurant thing where you snap your finger, you raise your hand at the at the waiter to come and attend to you. I rather wait until I make eye contact with the person if I'd forgotten their names. And then, you know, I'll put my hands together and ask them to please come, you know to me and so that that's the first thing you know when you acknowledge somebody by their name it's very important and you know we we teach the children in our children's uh, rights program you know that you have a right to a name you have a right to certain things you know we also teach them their responsibility obviously and when you walk into our playroom the first thing on your right hand side is a mirror so that you see yourself and you say I have a right to a name. I have a right to a nationality. You know, whether you're South African in our play space or you're not South African, you still have a right as a basic human being. So that, that for us, the recognizing of children is very, very important. You know, some of the kids, they call me um, the fairy godmother. I, I don't know how I got that name. Please don't ask me how I got that name. But, <laughs> but they, they, that's what they call me. And I, I, I make it a point to acknowledge the children before I even greet the parents so that they understand that, oh, wait, I'm important too because a child will come in with their parent and I will see them. I will acknowledge the parents with my eye contact, smile and greet them with my eyes. But when they get to the table, the first thing I do is go down at the child's level. I don't have to go too far, obviously, because I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, 
And I'll say, hi, how are you? My name is Mpo. What is your name? And the child will, you know, probably get scared. And the mom will look at them or the dad and say, hey, don't worry. You can tell them your name. You know, like, you know, then the child tell me, and I'm like, oh, that's great. Have you been here before? You know, having that conversation with the child first. And I said, oh, you need to show mom or dad how to play around because I know you're going to have more fun than they are. And the child feels like, oh, I'm important. I know how to do these things. I can do them better than my mom and dad. I'll show them, you know. So that, that's from, that's, that for us is very, very important because that's, that's when we build the image of a child. You build, you build their image. You build their character. You build, you know, um, you, you build the great qualities that they're capable of. That's why we even let them lead the play. Because sometimes as parents, you don't want to see your child doing something which you find which you or you deem incorrect so we, we always tell the kids there's no right or wrong answer there are just different answers and there are answers that work better than others for certain things so then the child is not afraid to say something or to do something thinking they will get it wrong that's why i was saying earlier that if certain things need to break let them break you know because then you can put a lesson in there you like so I, I, I mean, when I grew up, it, with, if we dropped a glass, my mom is Kosa, so a lot of Kosa women are known for being very, very feisty. If, if a glass would break at home, my mom would be like, yeah, well, what do you need now? A hammer, an axe, huh? Well, what else do you want to break? So <laughs> <laughs> I can definitely see your mom say that. <laughs> exactly. But I'm thinking, I didn't drop it intentionally. Like, what are you talking about? So for me, it was like, let me use this as a lesson. You know, for my kids, it was like, it dropped. And, you know, they'll come like, mommy, the glass broke. You know, but because they were used to seeing my mom shouting and I'm like, okay, the glass broke. What happened? You know, oh, I was doing this and I was doing that. I'm like, oh, you forgot to wipe your hands. So your hands were slippery. So what happens, because the glass is smooth and your hands are slip, uh, a bit oily, the glass slipped out of your hands. So smooth surfaces and oil, it's a lesson. Everything the is, kid is learning that. Oh, wait a minute. So, slippery surfaces and glasses. So, it slipped out of my hands. I couldn't grab it because the more I grabbed it, the more it slipped, you know. And then, then I teach them the safety. Okay, let's, call, let, let's clean this up in a safe manner. Let's make sure we have our shoes on because we don't want glass coming in underneath our feet because then we can get cut. And, you know, so it, it becomes a, a lot of lessons around a broken glass. Mpo, thank you for being a joy ride. <laughs> thank you for honoring God through your life. You've been very receptive of different people from different backgrounds and you've embraced the differences. You have valued human existence through the spirit of Ubuntu. Lastly, girl, <laughs> thank you for being a trip <laughs> through your humor and sarcasm. <laughs> Miss that a lot. Thank you, Osimpo, for being such a lovely soul, um, for teaching me how to facilitate with such a patient pace, as well as calming down the storms when you see that one is starting to panic. Uh, thank you so much for being such a great person. Mpo, thank you for teaching me that there is always something to be thankful for, something to look forward to and someone who cherishes you. I've known you only for a short period of time and for that I'm thankful. You're such a wonderful piece of sunshine that could never stop laughing, that could never stop teaching others. You are an amazing inspiration to myself and others. You taught me that there's no right or wrong way to look at people. Disabled people are only differently able to others. Thank you for the love you have for your wild friends, colleagues, and family. Wow. So using so, everything as a tool to teach. And, using everything and as you a were, tool. Yeah, at heart, you are an educator and from the get going. Yeah. What would be the funniest story since you've been at Play Africa? <laughs> oh, we have so many funny stories. But I think, I think the, the funniest thing for me uh, was trying to explain to people what I do. 
<laughs> in the <laughs> South African context. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a play. Like, like uh, so, yeah, and you know, where, where do you work, play Africa? Like, okay, what do you guys do? Oh, we do play-based learning for children. Okay, what is that? So, um, <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we do a lot of playing. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you... We get, I mean, I could get into the, into, into the roots and the technicalities of what, you know, what plays apart. Yes. But the person here just wants to understand what are you, what are you talking about? What and, do they pay then, you for? Yeah. And then they're like, oh, so you play. Huh? Like we are Zala. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, um, actually, yes, I do play. So you get paid to play. So you, are you going to work or are you going to play? And I'm like, hey, 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 hey. All right. Okay, let me explain this. So then I explained, like, listen, if your child is struggling with numeracy or literacy, it's not because they are dumb. It's because it is being explained to them in a way that they don't understand and we need to look at each child holistically. And, you know, I'll have to remind parents, like, you remember when we were younger and we were sitting and we were chased outside the house because the house has been polished and it's shiny and it's clean and the pastor is coming so they don't need your dirty feet on the floor. Yes, you remember they used to send us outside and we'd play these indigenous games. And then she was like, yeah, but that's because it was childhood. I'm like, yes, that's what we are doing. We are just enhancing it right now and we're moving with the times. That's basically what I do. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. Mm. Okay, but then you can still see that, whoops, lights yeah. are still off around there. <laughs> but they're just saying, okay, let me just leave this one who plays. For the <laughs> so that was, <laughs> that was really the funniest period in my life to explain to people what I do, you know, even my mom, before she actually came, because on the day that Play Africa came to the nursery school, she wasn't there. Even explaining to my mom that, mom, I- I'm a Play Africa, and like, yeah? You're Lala. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to work, mom, but it's, yes, it's playing, but I'm going to work. So just, that for me was really a funny thing, and you know, mm, yeah, it's, 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 it's just really funny. So <laughs> with, with the kids, we always have funny moments. It's hard to really just think of one. You know, kids, kids, kids are, are, are the best people in the world because they are yeah. so real. You know, yes. there's, no, there's no facade pure. that they yes. anyone. They're pure. They're like so angels, even the, yes. yes. Yeah, even the fairy godmother thing. I, I knew from a parent, like, oh, is that fairy godmother? Like, oh, yes, I'm, <laughs> fairy god. I'm like, wait, when did I become the fairy godmother? I'm asking myself that internally, but externally, I'm like, oh, yeah, of course I am. Like, what are you talking about? I am the very godmother. What can I do for you today, my beautiful little princess? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the other little girl said to me, oh, no, 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 I, I, I upgraded last week. I'm a queen now. I was like, I was like, oh, yes, then, then that means we just need to get this tiara of yours a little bigger. We need a crown. I had to save myself, Steve. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this yeah. is beautiful. Uh, w- what is um, what would be the 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 the, the most inspiring uh, story uh, in that time that you've been play Africa? The the most inspiring things that you've seen from the children or one children a story that really particularly uh, touched you. I think I had I had a most inspiring period at Play Africa. Um, you know, as, an, in, as a first inclusion coordinator, obviously, it, for me, inclusion doesn't mean like a tick box of what is required by your donors. Like, oh, you need to serve five people living with disabilities and you count them one, two, three, four, five, tick, they came to my space and out they go. For me, it's, w- inclusion is not just about counting the person. You know, I, I read somewhere, and I think I'm paraphrasing what, I'm, what, I, what I read, like, um, Inclusion is not just inviting me to the party, but inviting me to dance with you. Um, so for me, yes, there's so many events that I've attended where they invited people living with disabilities, but I, I didn't feel that dignity, you know, that they treat them with. But at Play Africa, you know, Gretchen made, it, it made a conscious effort to sit with me, like what would look like a success for you as a person who has lived around people living with disabilities, what would look like a success for you if we had to invite um, children living with disabilities? Because honestly, if we did not, if we were not able to include them, you know, 
I don't think I would have I would have said we should invite them because for me it's not about a tick box ex- exercise. But when we heard our first Creative Arts Family Play Day, it was in 2017 where we served about 900 plus uh, children um, in a space of four days. It was, it was almost like a play festival. We invited a school of children living with disabilities and they were included in the play. You know, we thought about, we asked them, I said, we, we asked because we, we can't know everything. I know a lot of people living with, um, with physical disabilities in sight, you know, not necessarily wheelchairs, not necessarily people that are on crutches, not necessarily people living with cerebral palsy, you know, or other cognitive uh, disabilities. But we had to ask, what would, what would you like us to do? This is what we have. What do you think would work best for you? You know, so, you know, we are big believers in nothing about us without us. That motto sticks with us in every single thing that we do, whether we're working with people living with disabilities or not. It's nothing about us without us. Don't make decisions for people just because you think you know it all. Ask. So we asked and the children had so much fun. They remembered us two years later when we came back, to, when we went to their school for a different program. They're like, oh, I remember you. You remember we came and we were on stage and we were dancing and you were wearing a pink tutu and you were wearing a pink tutu with the captain's hat. That didn't match. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it just, that yeah, means that they, you. they were included if they are able yeah, to they make it. Yes. <laughs> they had fun, you know, all the activities. And I said, guys, they said, we need to make sure that things are at a level. We need to have spacing of a minimum of about 90 centimeters for them to be able to go around in places. Let's just make sure that there are no barriers to access. Let's just start with the access. Let's make sure that it's accessible for them to get in there. And they're not standing there, you know, being made to wait because we're trying to maneuver them around things. So that was very, very important. And that is just one of the events that really stand out for me. And the second one was when I had to start now learning about different, you know, uh, different disabilities, you know. And I think my, my dad always, like, made me refrain from using the word disabilities. He said, no, he, said, he said to me, everybody has a disability. That's true. And every it's person. only this uh, and visible. I, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's just that mine is visible because I, you know, I have no eyes to, to see with. And, but you can't play the guitar, can you? I'm like, no. He's like, yeah, that's a disability. There you are. You are able to play the guitar. So the inability for you to do something is, is your disability. So, so I had to learn about differently abled people, you know, and I had to learn about, you know, people living with certain cognitive disabilities. I had to learn, and I'm still on that learning path. I haven't stopped. I'm still learning. I'm life. still learning for life. I'm, I'm going to learn for life. It annoys my mother to pits, but it's fine. <laughs> yes, I think we I'm, should get I'm, we should I'm, get your I'm, mom. I'm a lifelong yes, learner. we should get your mom on this podcast. She's quite a character as well. So. Oh, she is quite a character. She, she's a lovely character. <laughs> she's lovely. She's lovely. Definitely yeah, so, lovely. Yeah. So, so that's what it is for me, and you know, I mean. Especially, you know, you know, I think one one of the things that has really stood out for me is that sometimes, you know, when when people when a person is blind and you're like, oh, okay, so that's their disability, they're blind, and it just carries to out. But cognitive uh, working with people living with cognitive disabilities is so very different because people think that uh, children with autism all act the same way, and it's not true. It's so not true, you know the. Uh, so you have to look at certain, there's certain children that are nonverbal, others are just very sensitive to specific things, uh, others, others are runners, and others just like really, really loud noises. So you can't just generalize that, oh, okay, they, they, they are, yeah. they've got it's, sensory it's, Yeah, it's not therefore. one solution fits it all, yeah. No, absolutely not. Exactly. Absolutely not. And, and, and we've also taken off the labels at Play Africa of this, high functioning, low functioning, we don't like those labels, you know, we just say children function differently. I mean, even people on the neurotypical side of things, and I say that in inverted commas, the neurotypical, we function differently, you know, you can be in the, you can be in the same classroom, be of the same age, same height, same weight, same everything, and um, I'm better at uh, literacy than you are, you're better at numeracy than I am, 
So we, we just function differently, you know, and we our approach to things are different. So we just use differently instead of high or low. <laughs> Wow, this is exactly it and the importance of personalized learn, um, teaching and learning. Uh, this is definitely something that yeah. you are doing, um, that you are championing at Play Africa. Hello, I'm Lebo Masaji, the bassist from Late Antique. And I'm Itumele Manyanga Abalobe Mutomolo Amashlaji, the lead vocalist of Late Antique, also known as Duru Kaosampo. I am so fortunate to have met this gentle, kind, wonderful soul um, that has taught me that gentleness is the strongest force. What an honor to have known you. What an honor to have walked this life with you. What an honor to have loved you. What an honor to be loved by you. Our simple thank you for teaching us love. Thank you for bringing out the magic of being the in of, of the inner child. Thank you for just guiding us. You've been one of the most inspirational human beings in this life. Thank you so much to the family. We love you so, so much. Thank you, Elson Paul. We will always love you. We will always remember you. And thank you to Play Africa, uh, Toto, Lebo, Andi, Wilumelo, Makulu, LJ, Dibello, Dibello Ganyeso, Ganyeso, Zama. Zama. <laughs> May you all find comfort in these hard times. We love you. Thank you for introducing us to the magic of Play Africa. Thank you for being a part of our artistic life, creative life, musical life, and also bringing the magical experience of the inner child. We love you. Mwah. I'm Paul. Thank you for showing me how to show up in this world imperfectly perfect, full of life and full of adventure, for seeing everyone as something interesting and wonderful. You once told me that on the days when we feel like it the least is the days that we have to do the most for ourselves and I'll remember those amazing outfits that you wore and just the way you treated us all as if we were wonderful. Thank you so much, and Paul. Well, just to finish, my last question would be, what would be your most, uh, your favorite uh, poem or your favorite quote? Wow. Ooh. Gee, I, I, I have so many quotes that I love, but um, I think maybe, I, I think that the most true that have been on my mind recently um, is one from, um, one is by uh, Monica Montgomery Nyati. Uh, I had, a, we had a chat with her last week and, you know, she's, she's an educator and she was uh, very radical when it came to talking about race with the children in the U.S., especially, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, I think when she says, I think I'll, I'll actually stick with this one, Steve. She says, my radical actions were in alignment with my truth. And this is what she said after she was fired for being too radical in the way she was handling things. But I don't feel that she was being radical. But she said, my radical actions were in alignment with my truth. So for me, it's very important that one lives their truth. I, I'm, 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 for me, with Play Africa, I'm, I'm an advocate for inclusion through and through whether i'm at work whether i'm off work and um, that's just me if if you meet me in the bus you meet me in the train you meet me in the taxi and you are being you know offensive or derogatory towards people living with disabilities because nobody stands up for them best believe i'll be there i'll be on your neck <laughs> so i always live my truth <laughs> yeah you sure? And but... I have radical actions too. <laughs> well, Mpo, thank you very much. Play Africa is such a beautiful ambassador in you. This was a great interview. I want to thank you for sharing mm -hmm. with us the importance of inclusion, the importance of standing up, the importance of accepting differences, the importance also of letting the children lead the way to change through transformation. One thing we can take away from this conversation with you is how important listening to the children is and also how you are able to make this the core of Play Africa with your team. I enjoy particularly the fact that you 
and the whole team of Play Africa is acknowledging children as dignified human beings and empowering them to be agent of change, to be agent of transformation, to be at the heart of the new South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you to everybody who's listening. Yes, please do come and visit Play Africa and you'll really find amazing people. I think yes. he felt like part of the family in less than an hour. So it's like he's been there forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, miss, I miss you, all of you. Oh, we miss you too so much. <laughs>